Okay, now it's uh, time for the final part of uh, this week's lecture. And this time we are going to focus on diversity validity dilemma. We're going to see what are the potential solutions that can be implemented in order to, uh, on one hand, have a diverse workforce. So, for instance, as you see in this picture, um, to uh, have females and males in different types of occupation who uh, in recent years uh, could have been considered as a man's job. Uh, on the other hand, to make sure that we use tests that uh, represent a high level of validity. First of all, let's take a look at a power of specific methods in order to predict work behavior. In this uh, famous uh, meta-analysis, Schmidt and Hunter, they were trying to show what's the validity of different types of measures that can be used to predict job performance. As you see here in this table, uh, on the left-hand side, we have different tests. We have general mental ability tests, we have work sample tests, integrity tests, conscientiousness tests, and many other methods. So, for instance, P ratings or even uh, graphology. As you see, some of the measures, they provide high level of validity. That's the, the case for GMA tests, because the overall correlation between uh, GMA tests and um, work performance is uh, 0.51. Then we have work uh, sample tests, 54, and also we have um, trade or personality questionnaires uh, below. Also, we have, for instance, knowledge tests. For knowledge tests, the correlation between uh, the specific test score uh, and job performance overall is 0.48. On the other hand, we have also information what other tests besides GMA provides besides um, to um, uh, explanation of the job performance. Okay, so in this column you see validity. Uh, validity is uh, high for GMA tests, slightly higher for walk sample test. If we would interpret that in terms of effect sizes, we would see that GMA tests uh, and walk sample tests represent a high level of uh, effect size. It's a lower, uh, specifically it's lower for consciousness, but on the other hand, uh, interviews they also can represent if there are structured high level of effect size. On the other hand, which is more important in this case, you have information about to what extent specific measures provide prediction beyond GMA tests. So as you see here, for walk sample tests, the increase in validity over GMA test is uh, 24%. For integrity test, it's 27% and so on. So then you can ask a question, okay, apparently GMI tests are important, but also other measures like personality measures are also important and can help in order to predict job performance. This meta-analysis was published quite a long enough time, so uh, it was directly updated in the recent years. In this paper, uh, Schmidt and his team, they provided slightly different data. Again, we have a uh, high correlation for GMA tests. It's even higher than the previous meta-analysis. We are here, we have 0.65. Uh, it's similar for um, integrity tests. Um, as you see, slightly lower for personality measures like uh, conscientiousness. On the other hand, we have slightly lower percentage for increase in validity over GMI test. What does it say about the GMI tests? Is it really sensible to use those tests if we want to avoid uh, adverse impact, if uh, we want to create fair uh, selection procedures? Let's take a look at another uh, meta-analysis. It was published um, again, quite a long time, but still, results are really interesting. In this 
partial table, you see quite substantial uh, information because this table, it shows standardized differences between different types of groups. Um, uh, in this case, we have comparison between white and black, uh, groups uh, white and Hispanic, white and Asian, and also we have groups um, comparison between males and females. Because in many cases, those differences between females and males, and also between uh, people representing different ethnicities, uh, is uh, important when we discuss fairness and when we want to uh, judge whether a specific procedure is fair or not. This data suggests that if we compare different types of population, we can either get uh, relatively high effect sizes, so in this case this is a Cohen's d value, but still value around 1, it's a large effect for Cohen's d. So we can conclude that systematic differences in uh, general uh, cognitive abilities or general mental abilities, so GMA as well, we can also use this uh, label here, it's very high for comparison between white and black, it's also substantially high for white and Hispanic, it's slightly lower uh, for white and Asian, and in this uh, data they um, did not find differences between white and, uh, males and females. On the other hand, a method like structured interview does produce lower differences between white and black uh, groups. It means that when we consider the use of uh, different methods for personal selection, we also, in order to avoid uh, unfairness, we also should con consider different methods than only cognitive uh, ability um, tests. Player and Holt, they suggest a few solutions that can be implemented in order to reduce bias and thus in order to reduce unfairness during the selection procedure. Let's take a look at those solutions. They say that to reduce racial, ethnic and sex group um, differences and thus reduce adverse impact, first of all we should perform a job analysis. You probably remember that job analysis is also really important when we create measures, when we select the measures for personal uh, selection. Here it's also the case. It's really important to know what kind of skills, competencies or other um, variables, characteristics are important for performing job at an expected level. So that's the first element in order to reduce bias. Secondly, if it's really necessary to use cognitive tests, even though we know that they produce or may produce uh, unfair outcomes, still it's really important to take into account the possibility of using non-cognitive tests in order to uh, measure those work-related predictors that can be useful in order to predict high work performance. They also suggest that during personal selection procedure, specific, not general tests, should be used. So those tests that uh, adequately predict work performance for a specific job. They also suggest that where it's possible, we should use alternative methods that um, do not require mental abilities or are highly contextualized, like situational judgment tests or assessment center, when we can measure actual work samples. Also, they suggest that if specific tests are used, um, reduction um, of a cognitive load should be maintained. So, in order to uh, avoid adverse impact, we should not only minimize cognitive load or reduce cognitive load, but also reduce required verbal skills that are necessary to pass the specific test. On the other hand, they also suggest that 
predictor should be as closely measured as um, uh, job performance. If necessary, specific outcomes in work samples should be properly um, uh, measured uh, as uh, um, uh, we could obtain in uh, work samples. And if necessary, later on, we can weight different criteria uh, that are important for specific job. So for instance, we can consider that one aspect of job performance can be more or less important and thus find a predictor that at the top level predicts um, specific criterion, so a specific aspect of job performance. Also, that's a rather minor thing, but it's really important to use instruments like questionnaires, personality questionnaires, that have high face validity. Typically, if face validity is high, so the motivation of candidates to perform a specific test is uh, way higher than if the face validity is average or low. So if candidates see connection between test and future job, they are, can be more motivated, uh, can show more of their skills uh, than if the face validity is lower. Also, when validating different methods, more advanced analysis should be used. And it's not a topic that we are going to discuss later within the course. Because researchers, they found that more advanced analysis, like for instance, item response analysis or uh, diff analysis, can help us to detect those tests or those parts of the test, for instance, items that have high predictive validity. Also, um, they suggest that from time to time, if it's possible, some panels should review um, tests in terms of whether there are some sensitive items um, used. Items that can produce high differences or large differences between minority and majority groups. And finally, we can consider score banding. It's a procedure when we consider specific outcomes in two different groups, in minority and majority, as equal to each other. Let's uh, give you an example. We want to hire a group of females and a group of males for job in Brandwehr, in a, uh, that we want to hire people uh, to become firefighters for a specific unit, for a specific department, let's say in Amsterdam. We have scores for males and we have scores for females. Due to the fact that we've used tests that can produce differences between majority and minority, and we want to avoid unfair procedure, we can consider banding as a procedure that can be used in this case. Banding leads to assumption that if, for instance, a score in our test 110 is lowest, then we can just cut scores of candidates at this level. And later on, we can consider that scores of males 118, 116, and scores 117 for females are similar to each other. So even though you see here on this slide a difference, which is one in points, so males 118, females 117, both, both scores are considered as equivalent. Okay, let's summarize the process of test use if we want to avoid unfairness. First of all, when we decide to choose a test, we need to think whether adverse impact is possible when we use this test. Of course, we do not know that without data. So we need to use specific tests a number of times in order to see whether this test can produce differences between minority and majority groups. 
if we know that a test, let's say capacity test, cognitive capacity test, does not produce adverse impact, then we can say, okay, we can use this test. But if we know, based on a few selection procedures, that it produces adverse impact, then we move to another question. Can we hire specific amounts of people from both groups, from minority and majority? So is it possible to do quota hiring? If it's possible, so even though we may get some differences between majority and minority, and in order to avoid adverse impact, we hire, let's say, 20% from minority and 80% from majority, that's fine. We can say, uh, we can use this test. Although in some countries, like in Netherlands, it's not allowed to use a quota hiring. So at this point, we need to move to another point in this algorithm. If a test produces job-related differences, And still, it's fine to use it because those differences are job-related. Then we can consider, yeah, we can uh, think about using this test. If differences that we find are not important for, for job, then basically we need to uh, go back and we need to think about using a specific test. In other words, if a test produces outcomes, differences that are not job related, but then produces high differences between both groups, minority and majority, then we should consider a use of another test. Although, if we find differences that are job related, then we can move forward and ask ourselves a question, is there any alternative? So can we replace this specific test that even though produces differences between groups, majority and minority, but maybe there is uh, another version of this test or another option. So instead of a mental capacity test that requires high um, uh, verbal uh, load, we can reduce this load by using non-verbal tests. Then we should use it and then we can say that the whole procedure is fair. But if there is no alternative, the conclusion is that still, even though we find differences between groups, the test is still fair. And that's it for now. Thank you for your attention.